Hey, book people, I'm the book guy. I've got the shirt to prove it today. Woohoo! <laughs> Guys, today we're talking about the Stormlight Archive, this one right here. Now, normally in my videos, I introduce this series to you as if you've never read it before. Uh, I'm all about helping people get more information about these books and decide if it's the right thing for them. But this is the Stormlight Archive. It's kind of a different story. See, why am I even bothering to introduce this series? It's so well known. It's one of the best sellers on Audible. It sold 4 million copies and is literally a household name at this point. It's one of the juggernauts in the fantasy genre. So today we're going to do something just a little bit different and a little bit special. I'm still going to introduce this series to all two of you who haven't heard of it yet. Uh, so that means it'll still be spoiler free and it'll include a series overview. But I'm also going to do a bit of a deeper analysis on why is the Stormlight Archive so popular? What is it about the Stormlight Archive that has made it so successful? Why do people love it so much? Why is it so popular when fantasy books that are over a thousand pages normally sort of die in obscurity and don't get much of a following and yet this is such a bestseller? It's kind of unusual. So we're doing a two-fold approach on this video, introducing the Stormlight Archive and a deeper, more analytical discussion on what writing techniques have made this such a successful story. Let's look at the concept of the Stormlight Archive. There was a great war in heaven across the Tranquiline Halls. The Voidbringers cast humanity out of heaven and then chased them to the world of Roshar to destroy them utterly. But the Heralds came and rose up the Ten Orders of the Knights Radiant to fight back, and the great enemy was destroyed. At least, that's what the legends say. Now the world of Roshar is filled with shard plates and shard armor, remnants of the ancient weapons from that great war. They are massive swords that can cut straight through all substances and cleave the soul from a body and massive armor that gives the wearer superhuman abilities. A single set of shard plate and shard armor is worth a king's ransom. Wars are fought over them and won by them. When the great King Gavilar is slain by the mysterious assassin in white, his brother Dalinar must lead the country Alethkar into war to punish the killers, the mysterious Parshendi people, with humanoid bodies of rock and carapace. The Shardblade should give the Alethi the advantage they need to win this war. Yet Dalinar is conflicted. Why did the Pashendi kill the king? Who is the assassin on white who could walk on roofs and throw objects with his mind? Now Dalinar must lead a war that he's not even sure he wants to fight. Now the first elephant in this room... Yeah, these are some seriously long books. This thing is huge. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. That's what she said! <laughs> now, usually if a series is this long, where every book is over a thousand pages, it actually puts off a lot of readers. Now, yes, you and me, people like us, are kind of freaks, right? This kind of stuff really does it for us. But we are a minority, okay? A lot of small-time readers find big books like this to be intimidating. I even tell people, don't try big books if you're not regularly reading, because it will be overwhelming and stop you from reading more. Yet the length of the Stormlight Archive has actually served to make the series more popular. Stormlight is uh, one of the best-selling audiobooks of all time, largely because of the credit system on Audible. So if you're unfamiliar with it, the idea is that if you buy an audiobook with cash straight up, it will cost more money depending on how long the book is. Really big books like this one can cost $40 to $50. That's Australian. I'm sure it's different elsewhere. But when you're an Audible member, you spend $15, depending on your country, to get a credit, and then you swap the the credit for a book of any size. That means the longer the book is, the better deal you're getting through the credit system. And Oathbringer here is 55 hours long. It's one of the best bargains you can get through the credit system. In fact, that's how I earned my gold Mount Everest badge. <laughs> so it's very cost effective. Not only that, the Stormlight Archive is also narrated by, quite possibly, the greatest audiobook narrators of all time. Power couple Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. So they have voice acting that can rival the best anime, and the voices they put on for each character are so distinct, it's very easy to follow. I mean, who doesn't get chills when Michael Kramer does his voice for the Stormfather? <laughs> and when he growls, honor is dead, but I'll see what I can do. 
good stuff. So the long length of the series has helped it sell really well as an audiobook. Uh, the second reason why the length helps is because it is the st unusual structure of each Stormlight book. Let me explain. Sanderson often says that he plots out each Stormlight book as if it's a trilogy on its own. What that means is normally a story structure will have three acts, right? The three act structure, uh, the general rule is first act will set up, second act progresses, and the third act has the big conclusion. Now normally the three act structure kind of suffers a little bit from big books because it just means if it's a thousand pages each act gets stretched out so far and it becomes a bit tedious. That is one of the aspects of Malazan that can make it a bit difficult to read. But because Sanderson plots each book as a trilogy, that three act structure actually gets repeated three times. So that means it's more of a nine act structure. You would say that you get three introductions, three progressions, and three big conclusions. Now, I personally do find it hard to distinguish exactly where the lines are on those acts in a nine act structure, but that's actually a really good thing. Uh, the difficulty in finding lines means that the acts are seamless and it does flow quite naturally. You can't see the wizard behind the curtain, but rest assured the nine act structure is there in each book and working behind the scenes to keep the activity moving forward. The books constantly feel like something is happening even though they're that long. All of this simply means that there's a lot of activity in the books. Should I have just said that? So there are three big characters in book one. And that is extremely weird. It's a small number of main characters for a book series this big. You see it only through the eyes of three people. That means there's not a huge amount of world building you have to comprehend in order to follow the story. It's a big world, but the lens you see it through is small because there's only three people. That's it. And of course, there is a massive number of side characters, and as the series goes on, many of those side characters kind of get promoted to main cast level, if you will. But for now, we just have this holy trinity of the main three. We have Dalinar, Kaladin, and Shallan. Okay, sorry if that was an insensitive comparison. I just like the idea of Kaladin as fantasy Jesus. He looks like Jesus! Yeah, he looks like a hunky Jesus! Yeah. So Kaladin is the main character of book one. So he's a poor commoner from a poor village. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. He dreams of being a soldier and earning glory on the battlefield. But Kaladin's whole story is about how much the battlefield sucks. Kaladin finds himself as part of a company of men that are literally being used as cannon fodder. Worse, it's not even done to help win the war, but done so that the nobles running the army can profit from the war. Means that the nobles are kind of motivated to keep the war going indefinitely. Somehow in the midst of all this, Kaladin decides that he's going to try and do better. Make a difference in the literal darkest of circumstances. Refuse to give up and protect his men, even if it means from his own side. So Kaladin is a fan favourite among Stormlight fans, and probably probably my favourite as well. His big arc through the series is his struggle with mental health. So many fans consider Kaladin to be like the poster boy for depression. Although here's a technical little aside, I was actually chatting with a friend of mine who's a psychologist about this video, and told them that I was planning on talking about Kaladin and his depression. And my friend said, actually, depression's just the symptom the, the surface level symptom he's got, what he's actually suffering from, is complex post-traumatic stress disorder, or CPTSD. The idea is, PTSD is when you suffer something traumatic, complex post-traumatic stress disorder is when you suffer something traumatic ongoing for a long period of time. That's the effect that Kaladin has had for years of being a soldier. So yes, Kaladin does have depression, but it's actually one of the symptoms of his greater condition. But that's just a technical note. Uh, aside from that, Kaladin does struggle with the darkness within himself. He often feels hopeless, even in the happier times of his life. Depression is something that many people experience in real life, so it has been a huge source of encouragement to millions of Stormlight fans to see it so clearly talked about in this series and beautifully depicted in our boy Kaladin. Alright, second big character is Shallan, and I'm just going to come out swinging. Shallan is a an amazing character. She's the best. Yet there's this weird subgroup among the fandom who don't like her, and it basically comes down to this interaction. How about a girl who's got a brain who always speaks her mind? Nah. Shilana's from a noble family who has fallen on hard times. 
really hard times. They've borrowed too much money from powerful, shady people. And now, <laughs> she has this desperate plan to become a student to the princess of the royal family, so she can get close enough to steal their wealth from them and save her family. Shalan is one of those people, like me, who uses humour constantly to mask their trauma and feelings of insecurity. So Shalana is extremely extroverted and chatty and always wanting to say something witty to make people laugh. She's brilliant and beautiful and uses this to get everyone's attention while at the same time hiding from them. As I said, there are people who don't like Shalan, and they'd like to try to say it's because of bad writing or some sort of pseudo-technical reason. I mean, there is a word for what they're experiencing. But the truth is Shalan is just an amazing character. You gotta deal with it! Third big character is Dalinar. No boy, we love Daddy Dalinar. We should cast Pedro Pascal. So Dalinar is the brother to the assassinated king. On the night his brother was murdered, Dalinar was literally passed out drunk and completely useless and didn't help at all. So now he's dedicated to holding himself, his army, and his country to a much higher standard of honor. He used to be known as the Black Thorn. A powerful soldier wielding a shard blade and armor, and he could single-handedly turn the tide of battle with his incredible battle prowess. Now he avoids battle. He actually spends all of his time reading religious texts on honor, and rumor has it, he's hiding a debilitating condition. So Dalinar is sort of considered a national hero, yet in his own eyes, he might just consider himself more of a war criminal. Yet perhaps a war criminal trying to do better? So those are the three main characters at the beginning, and there's two little things you should know. First of all, their stories are very separate to each other. They don't interact. There's one little instance of crossing over at the end of the first book, but that's it. They are separate for book one. The second thing is that all of them are at the same time experiencing something miraculous. All three are seeing signs around them of what just might be considered magical. But we'll get to that in a minute. I talked about the characters in Stormlight first, not just to make my video more interesting, but because in Stormlight the story is extremely character driven. That's why they come first. To recap, the main three elements in storytelling is characters, plot, and world building. While they're all sort of considered roughly equal, and maybe world building is on the back foot, in the back seat of the car. But with Stormlight, characters come first. It is massively character driven, no matter how big or diverse this series has become. So the plot lines revolve heavily around the characters' journeys. And yet, all three plots are focused on two major goals. The first of which is the war between Alethkar and the Pashendi, trying to avenge the assassination of King Gavilar. So Kaladin is literally on the front lines of that war. Dalinar is back in the command tent, and Shalan is back in the uh, main capital city working as a scholar uh, looking into the histories and mysteries of that war. This is another reason why the three separate plot lines work so well, because they're all in different locations and yet they feel connected by the same goal. And the three plot lines complement each other by being unique and yet interesting for different reasons. This is another reason why Stormlight is so popular, because many big series have multiple plot lines going in different directions, but they're very disconnected from each other. So if you look at Wheel of Time, Game of Thrones, Malazan, a lot of the plot lines feel irrelevant. You might even have a main threat, and then you're spending time focusing on minor threats that don't feel like a big deal. It can be very frustrating as a reader. I mean, who cares about Perrin looking for Faely again when Rand just fought off six Forsaken at once? Who cares about Jon Snow being unsure of himself again when we've literally just witnessed the Red Wedding? And who cares about Mappo in Ikarium walking around being vague as hell for five books and just taking a leisurely stroll when the crippled god is about to break out of his internal prison and destroy reality as we know it? <clears throat> Sanderson avoids this frustration for the reader by keeping all of his separate plot lines converging on the same goal. And it's not just the case for book one, too. This is a common rule that he applies to all the later books. Even though some plot lines do get a little bit more disjointed than others, but overall it is still very focused. You never get the feeling that you're wasting time on a smaller, insignificant plot line. The other major goal that the plots focus on is the return of magic. So the Knights Radiant had 10 orders, and each order had a different bit of magic. Their magic is activated by speaking an ideal or a greater truth out loud. And this is another brilliant magic system by Sanderson. The magic is directly tied to the character growth. 
It's not like Dragon Ball Z where the character just activates more magic by getting angrier, right? In this case, the magic comes from the lessons they've learned. They discover the ideal or the truth that they need through their own personal journey. And that's where they find their strength. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The point is, in all three plot lines, the same magic and uh, revelation of the Knight's Radiance is slowly coming out together. So they are all experiencing different things, but from different angles. I hope that makes sense. So I first started reading the Stormlight Archive in 2018, uh, just a few months after Oathbringer came out, and Stormlight Mania was sweeping through Australia. I'd catch the train to work every day and see people everywhere reading Sanderson. It was awesome. I remember I was most of the way through The Way of Kings, and I was talking to a friend about it, and I said to them, this has got to be the least complicated world building I've ever seen in a fantasy series. My friend's like, really? Tell me about it. So I started explaining it to them, and all of a sudden I realized I had all of this information in my head about Roshar. And I was like, where did all this knowledge come from? Did Sanderson just like sneak into my house at night and just... I know Kung Fu. No, he didn't. Pretty sure. The world of Roshar is rich and diverse. And yet it's so easy to learn about and you're often learning about it without even realizing it so obviously that is because the exposition is well handled you get little pieces of information here and there and it all sort of adds up over time also the way it's introduced into the text is very seamless it's cleverly melded with the story so it doesn't feel like um it's a big interruption where you get information shoved in your face right Ugh. but it's more than simple good exposition the world of roshar is simply in the background to the story. It's almost like a footnote, it's literally just the setting. Though it is a fascinating and magical setting, it's, it's still just masterfully placed in the background. Now, this is actually really hard for writers to do, and for two reasons. Let's, let's do a little analysis of that. The first reason is that the thing that excites you as a writer may not excite the reader proportionately. It's a bit of a rule of thumb. I once read a story that a friend of mine was working on, and in the very first paragraph, they had several long words in an invented language of theirs. Now, they were very excited about these words, let me tell you. They even had hints, just laid down on the first page, yes, the first page, of how the syntax of those words followed certain language rules. Now, yes, it was impressive, and yes, it was like Tolkien. But remember, even Tolkien started his book with the line, In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. So I did my best to explain technical skills like language invention can be off-putting to a reader if it shows up straight away. That's why it's hard for writers to have their world building in the background, because we get so excited about it. We love our ideas and we want to show them off straight away. <laughs> Front and center, it takes incredible restraint to hold those ideas back. Secondly, it's hard to do world building in the background because writers like myself can struggle with insecurity. You see, writing down a story is like letting someone read the very private thoughts within your own head, and it can feel very invasive. So there's a huge temptation to present yourself in the best light possible. And this is a paradox of good writing and of life in general. If you want to impress people, don't try to impress people. Good writing often means having the humility to have good ideas and then just let them stand on their own merits. Not putting them on a podium, but using your ideas to make the podium itself so that the next ideas can stand upon them. So Sanderson does this style of background writing um, and it means that a very complex world is still easy for new readers to come in and to appreciate and to enjoy it. It's a big reason why I think the series is a bestseller. The second elephant in this room... <laughs> One of the most common criticisms Sanderson gets is that his writing prose is quite flat, and it's kind of true. On a line-by-line -line basis, his stories don't quite have that melodic flow that other books do. His writing style is all about communicating the information the reader needs in, in the clearest and most effective way possible. Sometimes that cuts out so much of the excessive flowing poetry, and it can cut out a certain sweetness as well. However, this is still a very valid style choice. His prose is part of the success, and yes, I'm a Sanderson fanboy, so I'm going to leap to his defense, obviously. But the truth is that simple prose is great for people who are not regular readers. Now, forgive me for butchering the English language for a second there, but I would argue Sanderson writes gateway prose. 
This is for people who may not be regularly reading and may not be big book freaks like the rest of us who love these big fat books. People with weak reading habits can still start the Stormlight Archive, even though it's super long, because the language is just simple. I'm in several Stormlight Archive groups online, and I frequently see people who, uh, who speak English as a second language, and they say they read Sanderson in English because it's easy English. It's very easy for them to pick up and practice on. So yes, while the prose does get some criticism and fairly, it is very useful in just selling books. There's a third elephant in this room. All right, the first book has an absolutely bonkers opening four chapters. I've spent over five years thinking about this opening and I'm still not even sure if it works. So the book starts with a prelude that shows that ancient war concluding approximately 5,000 years earlier. Then there is a prologue six years ago of the assassin in white killing the king of Alethkar and igniting the war. Then finally we start chapter one, which is from a random boy's perspective as he joins in Kaladin's company. And at this point we all think, great, the real story is starting, right? Wrong! Chapter 2 randomly cuts to 8 months ahead. This time it's from Kaladin's perspective, but he's in a very different circumstance to where he was in Chapter 1, and there's absolutely no explanation of what just happened. In many ways, the story actually starts from Chapter 2. And it's, it's a very weird and confusing and disjointed opening. Now, by the time you've read the whole book, it makes sense. The weird chapters 1 and 2 are done this way to introduce the Kaladin flashback sequence, which is interspliced a uh, occasionally between ongoing chapters. The prologue with the assassin in white is very action heavy and that's where a lot of the uh, the hooks and the excitement for the series comes up and a lot where a lot of the mysteries come up as well so that is very intriguing and even that prelude from 5,000 years earlier is directly relevant to where the book ends in like the final chapter slash epilogue. So all of it is relevant but it's still difficult to get into when you pick up the first book. You get four chapters in a row all from a completely different point of view and different perspective and they don't seem connected at all. It is a hard place to start. Personally I would still think why not cut two of those little sequences and add them in later? I don't know. For whatever reason the series has still been successful despite this weird opening and that kind of suggests to me something. I think only publishers and agents care a lot about that perfect opening. Most readers don't actually care as long as it's interesting. But that could just be my thoughts. So I critiqued Sanderson a little bit in my in my uh, Mistborn vi video for doing what we call lone representation in the first book because Vin is the only woman in book one. But as I also said in that video, Sanderson has learned a lot from his early days about including more diversity in his books. That really shows in the first Stormlight book and has continued to grow in every subsequent book since then. So for one, the Stormlight Archive consistently passes the Bechdel test. Um, that's that test that asks, do women ever talk to other women in the story? And is it just about the men in their lives? For example, Lord of the Rings utterly fails the Bechdel test. Where is Mama? But in Stormlight, Shallan studies under her mistress Yasna, and in every subsequent book there are women everywhere working together and participating with the men in equal portion in the plots. So that is why it passes the Bechdel test. I also love how Sanderson shows diversity in race within the Stormlight Archive. You see, many fantasy authors think, well, there's no way to do diversity of race in a fantasy setting, so I won't bother about it. And that's how everyone ends up white. But this is very clearly seen in Kaladin's story um, on the front lines of battle. His squad, Bridge 4, is filled with men from all over Roshar. So we have Rock the Unalaki from the Horn Eater Mountains, there's Lopin the Herdazian, and Shen slash Rlaine the Parchman, just for a few examples. So even though it's a fantasy setting, it recreates that real world feeling of a multicultural group of people. These characters even discuss their different cultures and ways of life, and there's a lot of respect and curiosity from the people listening. It's quite lovely. But the biggest area of representation for Sanderson is all things mental health. There are deep looks into grief, heartache, depression, anxiety, and a lot more. But he even goes to the next level and shows real life psychological conditions. So for one, his depiction of post-traumatic stress disorder is done with chilling accuracy, both in Kaladin on the front lines and Dalinar living with regrets later in life after being on the front lines. 
Now, we never get sentences in the book that straight up say, oh, he was shell-shocked. Instead, we get visual descriptions of hands shaking, self-isolating behavior, extreme irritability, and feelings of just hopelessness and overwhelm. Sanderson shows us the harsh realities of warfare and its effects on the human psyche and puts us in those shoes in a very evocative way. There are also multiple characters with autism in this book such as Teft and Renarin. I'm sure there could be an argument for Lopin having ADHD but it's not official canon. Uh, the point is that neurodivergency is also getting a shout out throughout the series as well. Another case of real world psychology which is really fascinating to me is there is dissociative identity disorder or DID. This used to be called multiple personality disorder but the name got changed because that term is misleading and wrong but this is a condition where someone suffers trauma at a young age and to cope with it the child's brain disassociates from that horrible thing so intensely that it splits into different personalities or or different parts. Now some of these parts will be childlike heavily emotional a little bit wild and erratic other parts will be like a strong protector who's a bit fierce and aggressive and of course every case is unique so people with did will often naturally and unintentionally uh sort of summon to the driver's seat of the conscious mind the part that they most need moment by moment and we see all of this in stormlight from one particular character's journey from book two onwards and it is masterfully done. However, all of these mental health chats do deserve a bit of a warning for this series. With all this grief, trauma, psychological conditions, it can lead us to some pretty confronting places. The big thing I want to warn you of in Stormlight is the depiction of suicidal tendencies. As early as book one, we do literally see a scene of someone standing on the edge of a cliff thinking about jumping off. It is some heavy stuff that's worth the trigger warning. The question is, why is that sort of stuff in this book? And the answer is simple, because Sanderson wants to confront it head on and help people overcome it. Remember how I talked about the Knights Radiant and how their magic comes from speaking those ideals? Well, this is where it comes into play. You see, our characters all experience a type of utter rock bottom at some point in the series. Uh, they reach a point of considering do they give up. And often, after they've stared defeat right in the face, that is where they find their greatest strength. This is where their ideals come from, their magic, their power. It's all unlocked from facing their, their hardest test and overcoming it and not giving up. This is a huge reason why Stormlight Archive is popular, because this story has meant so much to millions of people around the world. The lessons we've learned, the grief we've lived through, are all echoed in these pages. And I know many people like myself, we were thrilled when Rhythm of War came out in 2020, after nearly a full year of lockdown and COVID crisis all the time, when everyone's mental health was at a real low point. I can't speak for everyone else, but I know that book helped me immensely during that time. Uh, the ideal that Kaladin says at the end of book four, well, it just cut right to the heart of where I was in my life at that point. A lot of people experience a similar thing um, with different stages in the book and different ideals that come out. This isn't just why Stormlight is popular. This is why reading is popular. This is why we read, not just for entertainment, but for hope. We read so that we can feel a sense of wonder and beauty and excitement for life. There are a few series out there that inspire that as much as Stormlight. It has helped a lot of people with their journeys. I'm reminded of that quote, fairy tales are more than true. Not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. Stormlight shows us that all sorts of dragons can be beaten in our own world and in our own lives. So yeah, Stormlight is an unfinished series, and yes, technically that does make it like Game of Thrones, but unlike Old George, Sanderson's actually pumping out this series. It should get finished. So book five is coming out at the end of next year, 2024. Uh, in fact, you can track Sanderson's progress on his website. First draft is near 55% complete. We even have an unofficial title, Knights of Wind and Truth. So book five is actually going to serve as a midway ending for the series. It will conclude era one. So yes, we do have unending 
in sight. Now, after book five happens, there will be a, a time jump of an indefinite time. We're not sure yet. It's not going to be a big 300 years like the last one. Sanderson has said that most of the characters from Era 1 will have some sort of role in Era 2. So it's not going to be quite a severe time jump. In Era 2, there will once again be five more books. So there will be 10 books in total. The best of all is we can actually see the structure for those books ahead of time. You see, each Stormlight book has a, a character who is the focus for their flashback sequence. And there is, of course, one magic power, one order of the Knights Radiant that is focused on and explored in detail. Sanderson has already announced which character will be the flashback character and which magic order will be focused on in the series as well all the way up to book 10. So we do have our clues of where the series is going, and we are all very excited to get there. As I mentioned in my Mistborn video, the Cosmere on a whole is gearing up towards what we call the Space Age. This is where worlds will start to literally collide. There will be more crossovers between series and more tie-ins, and we should expect to see some of the world-shattering mysteries we've been, uh, we've been looking forward to so much. So there's much more to come. So how much should you try? Look, this is a really easy question. Book one is The Way of Kings, and despite the weird opening chapters I mentioned, the story is good from the beginning. Okay, so you don't have to read multiple books in this series to see what all the fuss and the hype is about. Try book one straight away, you'll get a feel for the series, and then I'll tell you right away if it's going to be the right one for you. Bam! All right! That is everything you need to know about the Stormlight Archive. Now, I hope I've given you a deeper appreciation for the series and why it has successfully claimed such a place among the fantasy genre. So coming up next, we're going to do a deep dive into the world of Joe Abercrombie's The First Law, as voted by you, actually. Um, we're going to be looking at all 10 books in that series. I absolutely love that series, and I cannot wait to get into it and talk about it with you. Uh, for now, you can support this channel, as always, by buying something from our shop, Rainbow Space Unicorn. So yes, this is actually my wife's business. Uh, her name is Kit, and Kit is doing incredible work there. So we have laptop bags that are shaped like books for all you book nerds out there. Uh, we've got necklaces and brooches that are fidgetable for neurodivergent or anxious minds, and a bunch of sexy enamel pins for all the book nerds out there. I hope you'll check it out. Thanks again for joining me. I really do hope I'll see you again very soon. Just remember, you are beautiful. You are excellent, you are talented, brilliant, and you are amazing in every way possible. So take care of yourselves. Okay, I love you all. Bye now. This is my beautiful cat, Nynaeve. She's the older of our two cats. She's really sweet and kind, where the younger one's an absolute psychopath. Aren't you beautiful? Aren't you beautiful? <laughs> Aw. This is her resting pose, where she uses my bicep as a pillow. It's really cute. Oh, goodbye, Nynaeve. You are a cat.